nine kilometres there, six of them, straight ads. Yep. This here, head across there, and a thousand dollars out of there. See, as I said before. It's, it's, I'm not being pedantic about no, no, it, but it's got to be, be correct. It's got to be, got to be done manually because they're, yeah. they're programmed to obviously drop on a thousand. changes it again because then it falls in all year round and you've got the grass patch on the other side. Use that all the time. Or the whole thing. If you say you have to do it, or you do get out of it, it's fine, it's easy to do. It's not easy because then you can't use it. And you've just had the problem you can use it. If you don't find it, you
Okay, councillors uh, and gallery, um, I have your attention, please. Good evening. I welcome you to this meeting of the Cardinia Shire Council. Please note that this meeting is being webcast live over the internet on the council's website. Councils will be available after the meeting if any members of the gallery wish to discuss issues of interest. We'll commence with the, the meeting with the following prayer, which I'll ask Councillor Colin Ross to read the prayer. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Almighty God, we humbly request that you bestow your blessings upon this council, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of your glory and to the betterment of the peoples of Cardinia Shire. Amen. Thank you, Councillor Ross. The Cardinia Shire Council respectfully acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Bunurong and the Rangiri people and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. We have received an apology from Councillor Jody Owen for tonight's meeting. Minutes of a previous meeting. Can I have a motion, please, to adopt the minutes of the meetings as listed? Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Brown. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Ryan. All those in favour, signify in the usual manner. For? Against. Carried. Have councillors got any declarations of interest this evening? No. The Council conducts its meetings according to the consent agenda. Councillors have advised of the matters for consideration this evening that they wish to discuss or debate. The remaining items will be adopted without discussion. First item, item four, draft social justice and equality policy 20192023 as withdrawn by Councillor Michael Schilling. Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to um, move the officer's recommendation that Council adopt the draft social justice and equity policy. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Can I have a, a seconder, please? Councillor Wilmot. Back to you, Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so the draft uh, social justice and equity policy provides a framework to uphold the human rights of our diverse communities and promote social justice principles of participation, access, and equity in all aspects of community life. 
the cohorts represented in the policy include um, the first people of our nation, people with a disability, people from migrant and refugee backgrounds and our LGBTIQ plus community. It aims to unite and strengthen some of Council's existing policies and actions and plans by adopting an intersectional approach in addressing discrimination and promoting diversity um, and inclusion. Uh, this policy recognises, I guess, an uncomfortable truth that not all people in our community have the same opportunities and there are some groups within our local community that remain marginalised and isolated because of intergenerational tra trauma, race, ability and sexuality. What, um, what happens when people are marginalised in communities is that we see high incidences of social isolation and this in itself significantly lowers quality of life and does place barriers um, to active community participation for those people. Um, whilst there is still widespread issues of discrimination across the world, <clears throat> we simply cannot accept this in Cadinia. All people in our community deserve to be treated with respect and have their voices heard. This is important to us as a council as we can better direct resources to communities that are struggling and ensure that our policies, buildings and services are developed to benefit us all. And that is why uh, this policy has, has been written. After all, it's local government's role to protect people and promote healthy living. And with a strong social justice policy, we can work towards a fair and just society where everyone is valued and our diversity across the municipality is celebrated. This is an overarching document that goes about ensuring that we have greater community participation, accessibility and inclusion um, at a personal and societal level. So there's um, a few points to this um, policy, um, which they are quite broad but they can be narrowed down um, depending on what on what's trying to be achieved. The first one is around equitable participation and this pr uh, principle recognises that a healthy community is underpinned by active participation where everyone has a genuine opportunity to shape the future of society. The next one is enhanced accessibility. So as a council we provide services and spaces which everyone can access and a great example of this is um, access and inclusion and making sure that everyone of any ability can access any of our services. <clears throat> and this includes um, places like our, our sporting um, pavilions, things like our local community centres. Um, the last thing we would ever want is a person not to be able to participate um, in our local community due to some poor planning decisions or um, a, a facility which has been built some time ago which doesn't currently comply with standards. It also talks about inclusive places and spaces. So planning for welcoming, safe and culturally appropriate places and spaces that encourage people from diverse backgrounds to access council owned and managed public spaces. The final point is around leadership and advocacy, which revolves around us being the level of government closest to the community. Therefore, um, we are well positioned to promote social justice and wellbeing whilst addressing discrimination and marginalisation of its residents. And that is a great thing about local government and being a local councillor is um, you do have a great ability to be able to look after a, a smaller amount of people um, and really understand the ins and outs of your community. And for me, um, I guess it's that aspect of being able to advocate for our diverse communities and working towards an equal society that personally made me want to run for council. Um, I believe that if you don't have compassion for our marginalised communities and a drive to do better, um, you simply shouldn't be here. And that's why I'm proud that, what, of the work that council has done in this space and the continued support um, that this council does give to social justice overall. So we're trying to achieve meaningful participation, empowered communities and being proudly diverse. And after all, diversity is something in a community that we should always celebrate. It's nothing that should be feared. It's nothing that should be swept under the carpet. Um, it's something that brings us together and makes us as a community stronger. Um, I'd like to thank Glenda George, who was the author of this document, and really commend her on the amount of community consultation that occurred um, whilst this policy was being formed. And some of the groups, um, and I, I won't mention them all, but some of the groups that have been consulted were the Cadinia Shire um, Disability Access and Inclusion Committee, which Councillor Brett Owen and I sit on. And we were there that day that um, Glenda came and did her presentation, and it was great. Uh, she uh, consulted with the Be Yourself program participants, the multicultural women's community groups, and also um, with members of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community as well. Um, look, overall, I'd say that this document is very important policy for the growth of our diverse community. Um, and at this point, I'm interested in hearing what other councillors around the room have to say on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. What a great report. 
Well done. Uh, second to speak, uh, Councillor Wilmot. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Schilling, for withdrawing this item for discussion tonight. The draft social justice and equity policy is an important document which will replace the Disability Access and Inclusion Policy 2017 and the Cultural Diversity Policy 2012, and it will be supported by a number of action plans which focus on specific areas of diversity, including the Disability Access and Inclusion Action Plan, um, the Reconciliation Action Plan, which is currently being reviewed, the Cultural Diversity Action Plan, which again is being reviewed at the moment, and the LGBTIQ Plus Action Plan. This policy aligns with many international, federal, state legislations and policies. Under the Victorian Local Governments Act 1989, Victorian councils have the responsibility to serve communities for the good of all, and, this, and it states a number of objectives, including to ensure that services and facilities provided by the council are accessible and equitable, and also that fostering community cohesion and encouraging active participation in civic life. The Public Health and Wellbeing Act of 2008 requires council to protect and improve and promote public health and wellbeing in the community. Under Section 38 of the Victorian Disability Act 2006, councils are required to develop and report on a disability action plan which must address key, a number of key outcomes. This policy also aligns with a range of actions within our own council plan and our livability plan 2017 to 29. There's no doubt that the population of Gdynia is growing and so is the diversity of that population. Appendix 1 of this report, of this policy, sorry, um, contains some really interesting statistics and data around that change over the last couple of years. Um, and being part of the cold advisory committee, I hear at every meeting some of the challenges that these new residents moving into our community from cultural backgrounds um, that they face every single day from going to Centrelink and trying to lodge papers I'm being told to go home and do it on the computer, but they haven't got computer access or they don't understand how to do it on a computer. So they go back to Centrelink just to be sent home again. The system's flawed and we've got to advocate to have that changed. Council currently does a lot of good work with our diverse communities, but there is still a lot of work to be done. And as a very wise person said on Friday at our Ida Hobbit celebrations, we need to keep doing it until it no longer needs to be done. Um, Councillor Schilling, you've got my full support in endorsing this policy tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Well said. Are there any other councillors, um, either for or against, to speak? Councillor Carol Ryan. Thank you, Mayor, through you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Schilling, for reading uh, the report and the policies. And. Um, I agree to a certain extent. I think um, part of this policy has addressed a lot of um, people within our community um, and in our, especially in our di diverse community um, and we're still growing and uh, we need more infrastructure for those reasons. One of the groups that is missing quite continually and it's not only local, it's also state and it's also federal. It's in reference to seniors. We don't address enough for seniors and what they go through, what they deal with every day. Um, mental health is one of the um, biggest issues that um, we don't have services for um, all around um, Victoria and the state. Um, or all of the states really, when you think about it, we're, we're addressing the youth, which is fantastic. We're addressing other cultures, but we're not addressing this culture in this age group. And I'm quite passionate about um, if we can uh, put a policy in um, addressing um, seniors and what, what they need um, and what services they need within our community. Um, I think that's really important because um, they struggle financially. They struggle going to Centrelink. They struggle, uh, a lot of them don't um, have computers and a lot of them don't understand a lot of um, the financial sides that they need to deal with every day. So um, their services, their everyday services that they do need um, and 
having someone advise them or having simply an area where they know they can go to um, as well as public transport for them to get there because the majority of seniors um, or um, later seniors um, age group um, don't necessarily drive or can't afford to drive. So I'd like to see some sort of um, policy added to this policy um, in reference to seniors. And um, um, I will um, support this policy um, with the, um, the extra added, if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ryan. Um, any other speakers uh, for or against? Uh, Councillor Colin, Colin Ross. There you go. Thank you, Mr Mayor. In, in bringing this policy forward, the uh, social justice and equality policy, equity policy, um, it started off with a vision of council and having to come up with cer certain things that we joined up to in Australia. And uh, our vision was, Cardinia Shire Council recognises the importance of supporting diversity in our vibrant and growing communities. Our diversity is highly valued and a source of great strength and resilience, promoting an inclusive municipality that respects human rights, celebrates diversity and fosters participation in all aspects of community life, is central to our goal of achieving better outcomes for every resident. And um, just adding a little bit more to my fellow councillors who have, have done a great job to share what this policy means. Uh, this social justice policy, equity policy, will provide consistency in council's approach to inclusion and diversity will recognise the complexity of addressing discrimination for those who experience multiple disadvantage, encourage more efficient use of resources by working collaboratively both in and out of council on local and shared priorities across the separate portfolio areas and support areas of council to genuinely meet our human rights obligations. I think this is a great policy. I think it does um, address so many of the different things that my fellow councillors have shared and I fully support it. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Ross. Uh, Councillor uh, Brett Owen. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, other councillors, for speaking on this item. I support uh, this report and the recommendation. I just wanted to make comment, as stated uh, previously, uh, this policy does replace a number of other policies um, of councils and action plan. And I just think it's... Uh, I've been in meetings at the Access and Inclusion um, Committee where um, the action plans and how they were being achieved was discussed at length. And um, I know councils have got a, a program called um, Cycle that reports back on these action plans, but it's really important for council to, to really ensure and report back on how we achieve the actions in these action plans. Um, I've been around the table in the Access and Inclusion Committee where you know, there has been some criticism um, actions have been closed, but real no, you know, explanation of how we've met those actions and um, and and what's been achieved. And I just think um, with this new policy, we need to be really clear on how we achieve those actions and evidence based, and um, so we can go to you know the community and go to our um, separate um, sort of uh, groups and, and committees to you know explain to them how we've um, achieved those actions and, and have that clearly evidenced and um, based. So uh, I support this policy um, and look forward to uh, actioning uh, those action plans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ron. Any other speakers for or against? I'll go to the mover, um, Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you to all the councillors that, um, that spoke to this item. And I'd like to acknowledge Councillor um, Ryan's passion as well and ongoing advocacy for our more um, for our, our senior citizens across the Shire. And I'm very happy to work um, in future in supporting actions, particularly around our livability plan, um, equity actions around strengthening those for for seniors. I think that that's very important. Um, uh, in conclusion, um, some of our um, diverse communities have quite horrific statistics in our in our Shire. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to really quickly go through some of them. Um, in conclusion, in terms of our cultural and linguistically diverse communities, um, seven out of 10 um, students report being the victims of racism. One out of three people from cold backgrounds have reported experiencing racism within sporting clubs. Um, 
And if you couple that with the statistics of, in, of the increase of our coal communities, um, since 2006 and 16, we've had an increase of 923% in our Indian community and 340% in our Chinese community. Um, and of course, there's a whole there's a whole list, but they're the two significant increases. So as we as we, as we move forward, um, we have to be able to adapt and make sure that that people are feeling safe in the community. In terms of disability and access, within our shire, 17% of our residents in our shire, that's just over 16,000, have a disability of some description. And as we know, not all disabilities can be seen. Um, and not um, yet to um, walk, people walking down the street, but they do exist. Um, the other um, segment, um, it was the LGBTIQ plus um, community, which are four times more likely to have attempted suicide, four times more likely to be homeless, and twice more likely of having high levels of psychological distress. Um, some of the social ramifications of these statistics are huge, and sadly not feeling safe or able to participate in our local community does have a significant cascading effect on a person and their supportive networks around them. So that's why um, it's important to have a social justice policy to underpin um, the work that we do to make sure people aren't falling through the gaps, um, to ensure that we're not only um, engaging people in um, the design of new facilities, um, such as what happens at the Access and Inclusion Committee, um, but also um, helping to lift health disparities that do exist between um, population groups, just to make sure that we can guarantee a fair society for everybody um, into the future. So um, thank you to everyone that spoke, and um, I hope that we have um, the full council support tonight for this policy moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling, and thank you, councillors, for your respectful comments tonight. So all those in favour? Four? Carried. Next item, item six, the quarterly performance report as withdrawn by Councillor Wilmot. Councillor Wilmot. Thank you, Mayor. I move that the quarterly performance report for the third quarter of 2018-19 be received and noted. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Ross. Back to you, Councillor Wilmot. Thank you. This quarterly performance report is for the period from January 3rd till March 31st of 2019. The report provides a variety of information informing Council and the community on key items. These include changes to legislation that may affect Council, updates on major capital works projects, progress updates on delivering the Council plan, and statistical information relating to the growth and service delivery. Tonight I'd like to just highlight a few, uh, some of the information provided in this report. Firstly, the Council plan performance. There are 147 council plan actions due to be completed in this financial year, with a target of 90% completion by June 30th. To date, 19 actions have been completed, which is 13%, and three actions have been cancelled due to duplication. And there are the full details at the back of this report. Um, the advocacy pack of projects required locally serves as our main vehicle to lobby all levels of government, as well as local members of parliament and endorse candidates. These packages were used in the recent state election with some pleasing success, and although the dates for the federal election hadn't been announced at the time of the writing of this report, um, the packages will continue to be used in the lead up to the election, and I'm sure the next report will contain information on the success of that advocacy. Uh, Council continues to seek funding from a number of state and federal government funding projects. Um, for the current financial year, 23 grant applications have been lodged for a total of $7.5 million. And so far, 14 have been successful, um, equaling $3.5 million. Uh, we started this year with our annual Australia Day celebrations and the announcement of this year's Australia Day Award winners. We celebrate and thank all the incredible nominees for the work they do for their communities. And we congratulate the award winners, Dr. Hapreet Kandra, who is the Citizen of the Year, June Wright, who is the Senior Citizen, and Megan Venables as the Young Citizen of the Year. The Yakaboo Festival was awarded the Event of the Year. The Community Satisfaction Survey was undertaken at the start of the year, and we will receive the results later in the year. In February, Council adopted its social and affordable housing strategy, and we also launched the Kadinya Commu uh, Shire Community Food Strategy and Action Plan. 
the hills were also alive with the sound of music as well for the um, annual summer music series which took place each Sunday afternoon in February at the beautiful Emerald Lake Park. Sadly, on Friday the 1st of March, a fire started in Bunyip State Park as a result of lightning strikes. During the months since, we have seen amazing examples of courage, resilience and generosity. This strong community spirit continues as people begin the process of cleaning up and rebuilding. Council thanks the emergency services and all the volunteers who worked tirelessly over an extended period in very tough conditions. We also thank the agencies, the not-for-profit organisations and volunteers who assisted Council in the relief centres and the ongoing recovery efforts, as well as the very generous businesses who donated meals, food, water and other essential items during this time. Council staff have provided relief services, community support, road and roadside dangerous tree clearing and importantly assisted residents who had suffered building loss and damage. I note that neighbouring councils and indeed councils from around the state have also provided support including staff, vehicles and equipment and providing safe places for animals and we are most grateful for that help. We will continue to work with residents and business owners as well as relevant agencies to support our community through the recovery process. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the staff for their fantastic compassion and professionalism they have shown during the relief and now the recovery period. They have at times had to work under very difficult and confronting circumstances. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the CEO, Ms Carol Jeffs and Ms Jenny Sekluna for the leadership they have provided to not only the staff but to ourselves as councillors. You've kept us all well informed and continue to do so and personally speaking I greatly appreciate it. Lastly, I'd like to quickly touch on some of the growth indicators for this quarter. Subdivision applications are 59% higher this quarter than the previous quarter, with year-to-date figures on par with the previous year. The statements of compliance issued this quarter are 77% lower than the last quarter's four-year high, and the year-to-date figures are 14% higher than the same time last year. Residential building completions are tending downwards and are 39% lower than the last quarter. The family growth rate has slowed to four families moving into the Shire per calendar day. However, the year-to-date figures remain stable at six families per calendar day. This quarter, there have been 455 births in the Shire, which is slightly lower than the last quarter, but 10% higher than the last year. The enrolments at maternal and child health have decreased by 3%, but are 8% higher than the last year. I'll leave it there for the moment, Mayor, and I'll look forward to hearing other councillors' comments. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Wilmot. I'll go to Councillor Ross, but uh, thank you for your report and, and thanks to the staff. Um, I second wholeheartedly. Um, Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think uh, Councillor Wilmot's covered just about almost every inch of the report, so I would only be repeating what's been said. So. I endorse what she said, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Good idea. Um, any other um, councillors um, want to um, speak on this in this item? I'll go back to Councillor Wilmot for further information. Thanks. Thank you very much. I might have to test it one day and see uh, how much people really pay attention or whether they're just happy to endorse what I say. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this look, this report is a, is a great report. I, I love reading this report each time it comes to us and it has a wealth of information. So I, I, I do encourage residents to read this report if, if there's anything you're going to read. This is the report. It gives you a much better understanding of what Council is doing. So I just seek the support of councillors to endorse the report tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, we'll signify in the usual manner all those for this report. Against? Carried. Next item is item number seven, the quarterly finance report. Also withdrawn by Councillor Wilmot. Councillor Wilmot. Thank you, Mayor. I move that the quarterly finance report for the period of July 1, 2018 to the 31st of March 2019 be received and noted. Thank you, Councillor. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Jeff Springfield. Back to you, Councillor Wilmot. Thank you, Mayor. 
As mentioned, this financial report is for the first nine months of the current financial year, being July 1 to March 31st. The report is broken into four sections, each highlighting different components that affect the financial performance of Council. And they are the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement and the capital works. The analysis undertaken as part of the financial performance report is based on the differences between the 2018-19 budget, which was adopted in May of 2018, and the actual result as at 31st of March 2019. The operating result for the nine months is a surplus of $6.3 million, which is $7.6 million better than the year-to-date budgeted deficit of $1.3 million. Operating income is $5.3 million favourable to budget, predominantly in the gr operating grants, interest rates and charges. The operating expenditure is $2.2 million favourable to budget, mainly in finance costs and materials and services, which has been partly offset by employ employee benefits. A detailed variance analysis is provided as part of the income statement in the report. The balance sheet shows that under the current assets, trade and other receivables have increased by 16.5 million due to recognition of rate status for the year. Under non-current assets, land has increased by 67.4 million, primarily due to revaluation, which has also resulted in an increase in revaluation reserves. Current liabilities show trade and other payables currently have increased 22 million due to recognition of unearned rates and charges revenue for the remainder of the year. Provisions under non-current assets have increased by 110.5 million due to recognition of future DCP commitments and have been offset by a decrease in reserves. The increase in accumulated surf surplus of 69.5 million primarily relates to the year-to-date net surplus. The cash flow statement shows the total cash balance at the end of March 2019 is 106.2 million, which is 3.1 million lower than this at, lower than as at the end of June 2018. Council cash is 1.8 million higher and developer contribution plan or DCP cash is 4.9 million lower. Excluding DCPs, the cash balance is 68.5 million dollars and is committed to capital carry forwards to 2018-19 and general council operation. The final rates instalment for the year, which is due at the end of May, will have a positive impact on cash flow. In Capital Works, the total project expenditure is currently 41.8 million, or 39.3 per cent of the full year revised budget. This is 15.8 million more than the same time last year, but 12 million lower than the year-to-date budget. The major items of expenditure for this year have been the purchase of land at 280 Princess Highway Officer for the Jin Jin Bin Reserve and at the corner of Ricks Road and Officer South Road Officer for the Future Road Reserves and continuing works on major capital projects including the Cadinia Cultural Centre, Deep Creek Reserve, James Bath Rec Reserve and the Hills Hub. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Um, Second to speak, uh, Councillor Jeff Springfield. Councillor Springfield. Uh, nothing further to add, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Springfield. Any other uh, councillors to speak on this item? Okay, I'll go back to the um, mover, Councillor Wilmot, to um, sum up, thanks. Thank you, Mayor. This detailed report is the result of members of the Finance Business Unit meeting monthly with department managers to discuss their year-to-date progress against the budget for both operating and capital works programs and further discussions with the relevant general managers. I seek the support of councillors in endorsing this report. Uh, thank you, Councillor. OK, we'll signify in the usual manner. All those four. Guys, carry it. Councillors and gallery, this concludes the discussions of the items withdrawn tonight. Can I please have a, a motion to adopt the recommendations for the balance of the items listed? Can I have a mover? Councillor Carol Ryan. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Schilling. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you. We move on to, I note that there's several reports from various committees.
have been tabled in addition to the minutes of, of recent council briefings and sessions. And these are available if any councillor wishes to view them. Councillors, any councillors have any matters to report, please? Councillor Brett Owen. Councillor. So this is councillor reports, isn't it? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Just, uh, I just want to briefly just bear with me. Um, uh, recently, on Friday, you attended the MAV State Council, um, represented Cardinia Shire Council in that forum. And uh, thank you, Ms. Association of Victoria, MAV, uh, advocate to the state government uh, to strengthen all planning schemes to bring properties under a heritage overlay into a more protected system to ensure local heritage sites do not become deliberate dilapidated and derelict through the process of demolition by neglect and therefore receive a similar level of current protection afforded by the Heritage Act 1995 for sites of state significance. So uh, the reason why Council uh, moved this motion because we've got a number of sites in Cardinia that we're very concerned about and it's fair to say it is the, uh, the, the Kiln site in Officer and also the Emerald uh, Country Golf Club. Um, so that motion was passed and Council gave the, the following rationale for that motion. The incidence of demolition by neglect or local heritage sites is of, on the rise in Cardinia Shire and across the state. The loss of local heritage sites by neglect in combination with the sheer number of properties under the heritage overlay has raised increased concerns within our community. In attempting to respond to the concerns and address the problem, it has become evident that there is a lack of planning and enforcement tools available to local councils to protect the sites, particularly in comparison to sites of state significance controlled by the Heritage Act. The recommendations in the 2013 report, Demolition by Neglect 1, commissioned by the National Trust of Victoria, examines and addresses this issue. The report provides a suite of tools and, and options available to local councils. The strengthening of local amenity laws is one of the key recommendations. Enact and strengthen across all municipalities to govern maintenance of derelict or de pallet, oh, sorry, dilapidated, sorry, I'm having uh, troubles with that word, uh, buildings, sorry, run down, that's a good one, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, combined with greater enforcement powers and sufficient penalties provide a distinctive uh, amenity laws governing building maintenance should be enacted or strengthened across all municipal councils of Victoria. So um, our rationale went on, but it's just, it's really important to acknowledge that council is taking this issue very seriously. We've got uh, a number of significant uh, sites in our, particularly obviously our shire, that we've got very concerned, you know, strong concerns about, and we want the state government to assist council to how we can, you know, save those sites from you know, being neglected um, so we don't lose them. So thank you, Mr Mayor, for raising that issue. I know all councillors around this table are very concerned about losing you know, these significant sites and we need to do our very best to, to protect them. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch base on a project that the Beaconsfield Progress Association has been heavily involved in. That is the, the, the Bowman's Track. Um, it's a long history. Bowman's Track um, Council has been working with the Beaconsfield Progress Association to redesign and install new and improved signage for Bowman's Track. Um, uh, Bowman's Track was constructed in 1862, which was instigated by the publican Janet Bowman to facilitate access for travellers from Beaconsfield to the Yarra Valley. Uh, the 80 kilometre track starts at Cardinia Creek near Mrs Bowman's Hotel, which is now the central hotel and it heads northward linking the Hughes track uh, to Tarago Valley. So thank you to the council officers. This has been a project that the Beacons of Progress Association has been heavily you know, promoting and working with council. We've um, replaced the old signage that was probably put in, I think, in 1988, the bicentennial year. And over time, these signs have either been lost or removed or, you know, degraded. So it's great that we've now got 
um, wayward signage installed at you know a number of locations in the hills and and across the ranges and and going to the Tarago Valley, which is which is great. So thank you to the BPA and council staff to to it's a very small thing to implement you know those signage, but it's a great um, you know respect and and acknowledgement of our history. So thank you very much. Thank you, councillor. Well reported. Any other councillors' reports? Councillor Colin Ross. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, since our last council meeting, I'd like to report that um, I believe the majority of councillors attended Anzac Day celebrations, um, and I went down to Lang Lang dawn service. And I must say, uh, it was I haven't been down there for a few years, but they've done their their place up. I say it, it, it was done absolutely <laughs> fantastically. They had a parade afterwards. Down the street, they had the people from Cerberus come on a bus. Um, they had one of the last people who fought in some significant wars in World War Two down there. Um, he got up and made a, a speech on behalf of um, Anzac Day. Uh, that was well attended by all the people at Lang Lang. I went up to uh, Gembrook for their midday walk, Anzac Walk, uh, which I attend every year. That was very well attended as well. And from the reports back from all the councillors, um, I think that their shire does it extremely well. I feel very proud that we've got people who do stand up and attend these occasions in memory of those who, who gave the ultimate sacrifice for us. Also, too, I attended at late notice um, the Dolphin Gymnastics Club down in um, uh, Carrum Downs on a Friday evening and uh, it was um, shared that they invited us along, funnily enough, because... Um, a young boy had won some quite a few medals in the Victorian Gymnastics Championships held in Geelong. His name is um, James Jameson O'Reilly and he competes in Level 7. Um, his team and the club that he represents at Dolphin, every team they entered in the men's gymnastics won first and gold in the Victorian Gymnastics Championships. He finished second overall in his, his uh, age group and he also won many individual medals. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a little bit of inside running on knowing what I was talking about with this, having an understanding of gymnastics and what parents put in the time and the effort that they uh, create this opportunity for their children. Um, this young boy from Upper Beaconsfield, um, his parents drive him from Upper Beaconsfield to Carrum Downs I think five days a week to do all the training that he does. Um, I I made sure that um, all the students there knew how much their parents put in and the dedication, and how wonderful it was that they'd um, worked their way up to to great success and were achieving the greatest for themselves. Um, I must say they've got some amazing coaches over there. They had one coach from the Ukraine who won an Olympic. Uh, bronze medal in the rings in 2008 in Beijing. They've got another guy who was the uh, Australian men's gymnastics coach going back a few years ago. Um, and I thank them very much for the time and dedication that they put in for these young people so they can achieve their dreams. Anyway, it was, it was great that I could go over there. Um, they've got a, a very small gym over there and they're trying very, very hard to get their council to um, put some money towards helping build a bigger gym for them. Um, also, too, in in this line of um, area, I must say, um, councils can do do things to help different organisations with inside. I attended Monash Council the other day, um, and they passed a tender for a twenty one million dollar complex to be built in Oakley, which included an $8 million section for the Waverley Gymnastics Club, which my daughter's in. And for those who don't understand uh, gymnastics, uh, that club has 1,800 females go to their club. They've got three to 400 on the waiting list. So, um, and also too, just another little header here, the Australian Winter, Gymna Winter Olympics team had a third of all their people who competed were ex-gymnasts. Anyway, just a little bit of an insight. It was a great going along. Thank you, Mr Mayor, for sending me forward that invitation. I know the ward councillors up there got invited, but it was at late notice and, and unfortunately they couldn't attend. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Ross, and I'll thank you for attending on my behalf, on our behalf as councillors, and um, I really um, 
Really great, great job, well done. Thank you. And on the Anzac Day, I know that Lang Lang, you went and represented um, the ward councillors, the port ward councillors, Ray and myself, um, up there. And it's really good to see councillors attend uh, the Anzac Days, particularly the dawn service ones, if we can at least have a councillor there. It was um, fantastic to have you there. Thank you very much for that. Any other councillors' reports? Councillor Ryan. Thank you, councillor. Thank you through you, Mayor. I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, just one um, organisation that was really important to me um, and I have um, great passion for the people that work there. A lot of them are volunteers. Uh, the Association for the Blind. Uh, I was invited along because they had a, um, an event called The Voice. And what their aim was, was to prove to the public that um, you didn't have to have sight to be a good singer. And uh, the talent, and this was all around the state that came in um, as contestants, and um, to and the majority of um, age group was from um, 45 onwards, which was quite interesting as well. So we had some of the, um, the um, guide dogs, and uh, they were well behaved, which was really interesting. So, you know, um, I suppose they thought they were still on duty at that time. And um, just to see the interaction between um, the guide dogs and um, the community um, for the blind and um, how they interact and, and their emotions um, being brought through with their, with their singing, um, I was just so thrilled to be um, have the the opportunity to be um, invited there and um, if anyone gets an invite, um, I would advise to go along because it's quite an amazing um, evening and um, you'll be most welcome. So I just really wanted to bring that forward as, again, another area of disabilities that sometimes we forget about. So thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ryan, for your detailed report. Any other councillors? Okay, I'll just finish by saying that um, uh, the Yakabu Festival, the Yakabu um, Festival in, in Pakenham was uh, a fantastic event with a new uh, venue, being at the new venue at the um, uh, the PB Ronald Reserve worked very well and uh, so I think it will be there for the time being, um, for the next next few years anyway. So it was really good to see that uh, being success and the big crowds that were there, I was um, lucky enough to open it um, and it was really great to see the community there um, embracing the uh, Yakabu Festival. Um, the other weekend I, I went to the uh, Nari Warren um, and District History Group. They had a, um, a 30th birthday um, with the Mayor of Casey. We, we both celebrated together with the, they were the, the royalty, what I call the royalty of history in our region. Um, and they had a 30th birthday, which is really um, fantastic day we had there together in Cranbourne. Anyway, that's all the reports we have. Uh, thank you, councillors, for your uh, detailed and passionate support for our community. Well done. So, councillors, do we have any petitions? Is there any petitions to be tabled this evening? None, Mr. Mr. Evans? OK. We have received two questions from our Andrew Cook. Is Andrew Cook in the uh, gallery here? Andrew Cook's not in their gallery. OK. We will respond to Andrew Cook if... Um, uh, we'll respond back to him with writing of his two questions that he had uh, for this evening. Unfortunately, he's not here, so we can't actually um, read them out this evening. But Mr Evans, uh, we'll get back um, to him in due course. We, we have received a question from Jesse Christie. Is Jesse in the gallery? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I'll refer your question again to um, Andrew Barr to read your question and answer. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Jesse, thank you for your question. Um, so Jesse's question, keeping in mind the costs of labour materials and asset depreciation, what is the estimated annual cost to maintain and grade LL Road in officer? Uh, road counters have been placed on some dirt roads within the Shire. What are the top 10 most used unsealed and where does LL Road sit on this list? Again, thank you. Um, so going through our, 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 our road maintenance costs, council manages over 800 kilometres of unsealed roads across the Shire. The average cost per kilometre of unsealed roads is about $6,000 per kilometre. Um, LL Road being a, a shorter section of road, about a kilometre long, uh, the average costs are slightly higher than the council average at around, around 9000 per annum. Most recent traffic counts on LA Road was about 220 cars per day. Um, 
and I acknowledge most of these would be during the peak hour and the school runs, I would imagine. Um, with this number of vehicles, this will put LL Road just outside the top 40 of unsealed roads uh, in the Shire for traffic volumes and less than half uh, of the highest traffic volumes. So the likes of McGregor Road and Huxpool Road have approximately 450 to 600 uh, vehicles per day, and that's in comparison. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, uh, Jesse, for your question. Uh, you can receive it back in writing if you prefer to have it in writing, or is that satisfactory? Thank you very much. Thanks for the question again. Uh, next, we have received uh, three questions from uh, Mike Hall. Is Mike in the gallery? Thank you, Mike. Thank you for your questions. I'll refer your first two questions again to Andrew Barr to read the question and answers. And your next question will be to Tracy Parker in a moment. No, it won't be. So we'll go to the first two questions to Andrew Barr. Okay. Okay. Andrew, thank you. Mike, thank you for your correspondence. Uh, Mike's question, uh, the response has come through. I'm the president of the Cadenia Deer Management Coalition. Our main focus is protecting our environment through humane deer reduction. We're not only the group trying to reduce deer numbers along with countless individuals. One of the obstacles we see in the future as the numbers of deer being culled increases is what to do with the carcasses. Is Cadenia Council able to support the reduction of deer in our shire by enabling the pickup and disposal of deer carcasses either from private property or from roadside verges if we can get them there? This would, could be a similar mechanism to the retrieval of roadside kill currently being picked up on behalf of council. Uh, so in response, um, again, Mike, thank you for that. Uh, local government is in the infancy stage of understanding and developing deer management programs. One of the largest obstacles is the geographic area they cover and ability transverse wide areas of land. Any resources council commits to deer management needs to be considered uh, with, the lighter, with the wider landscape. Without a regional approach, um, with our neighbouring councils, any management program outcomes would likely be short-lived. Uh, rather than reacting to the current issue, the organisation is focusing on long-term planning and sustainable outcomes. Council is part of the Eastern Pest Animal Network. The network of several councils is currently developing a brief to engage experts to develop a regional pest animal strategy. We have a much better chance of success when working at a regional level, investigating resources and running programs simultaneously. Um, with regards to road kill, which you mentioned in your, in your note, road kill is collected by council as a duty of care for road users, safety and prevention, preventing a health hazard. Uh, other options at this stage currently include on-site burial or relocation of the pack and transfer station or other landfills while we look to this long-term solution. Thank you, Andrew Barr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, for your two questions. I'll refer the next question on to um, Andrew Pomeroy, it is. Um, acting uh, General Manager for the GM. Uh, thank you, Andrew Pomeroy. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and through you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for your question. Um, I'll read it out first. I I'm President of the Cadinia Deer Management Coalition. We're a local group of local landowners who have come together to try and reduce the impact of feral deer on our environment through humane deer reduction. Shooting is the only method currently recognised as being effective in reducing deer numbers. Although this is not Although this is legal in our area, it is not without its dangers. Among other things, our group is endeavouring to supply local landowners with advice on how to select an ethical and safe hunter and the various rules in which should be put in place to make hunting safer on their property. This raises legal questions for us and, we're, and we are seeking the services of a lawyer to guide us through this issue. We are not and will not be the only community-based group focused on community service to have legal questions needing answers. Rather than requiring such groups to seek funding for legal aid, could Council consider offering the services of a Council solicitor to give professional help to these groups in the future? Thanks for your question, Mike. Um, and uh, I understand that your group has also applied through Council's uh, grants program as well in relation to this matter, and I thank you for that. Um, those deliberations will be occurring shortly for, um, for that grant uh, submission. Uh, I do note that that grant submission process has been oversubscribed, so there will be some groups that, uh, that miss out on, on achieving that, uh, that grant funding. Um, I can say, though, however, uh, Council isn't in a position to supply a, uh, 
a lawyer, as uh, we actually don't have a, a registered lawyer on our books, from, from providing, uh, I suppose, advice to community members. Although you can uh, seek advice and assistance at the Not-for-Profit not Law Information Hub. It's a free service. Uh, you can find it online at nfplaw.org.au and it's exactly what they do. So if you don't get your grant funding, there is an avenue for you to, uh, to get some assistance there. Thank you, Andrew Pomeroy. Um, Mike, would you like those um, those answers in writing, uh, which maybe the information that um, Andrew Pomeroy gave a moment ago about the references where you could go? Um, and Andrew Barr, the Acting uh, Manager of Infrastructure and Environment, are you able to um, um, give a, an answer to Mike through Doug? Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. And thank you, Sir, for your... And we've got one more. Yes, through you, Mr Mayor. Yes, thank um, you, Andrew. There was one more from Mike here. Yep. Um, so, Mike, uh, question was around, do Council consider the ecological costs of allowing further subdivisions in bush areas? Every new residence constructed in our area results in a massive amount of clearing around it. This is frequently outside the guidelines of the 1030 rule, which is poorly enforced by Council. Mike, again, thank you for your, for your question. Um, a new app, uh, and in response from our, from our planning department, a new application for a subdivision that requires removal or the consequence of loss of vegetation is subject to assessment under the planning scheme as our overarching regula regulation. When the council receives new application for subdivision of bush properties, there are stringent zoning and overlays that protect trees and bushland areas. Environment management plans are provided to council which are assessed in fine detail with avoiding and minimising removal of such as much vegetation as possible. The 1030 rule and the 1050 rule are exemptions that allow a person to clear vegetation to help protect this, their property from bushfires without a planning permit. The rules only apply to buildings and fences built before a certain date and they do not apply to new subdivisions themselves. Thank you, Andrew. Um, could you get that also that, that last question and answer? Um, back to Mike, please. Thank you. Our next, next question was received from Julian Ronald, and I see, and I acknowledge um, Julian Ronald in the gallery this evening. Um, I'll refer your question um, and answer from Andrew Barr, our Acting Manager, General Manager of Infrastructure and Environment. Um, Andrew Barr, thank you. Again, thank you, Julian. Julian. Um, so Julian's question was, when recently applying for a temporary signage permit, I observed that the current temporary sign policy is only relevant to the Hills area covering Emerald, Avonsley, Cockatoo and Jembrook. A limit of three signs has been determined suitable for this area. The Pakenham Township has 10 major entrances and 48,000 people, which is a very different situation to the Hills area. The Hills temporary signage policy is totally inadequate for this area. Uh, and two questions to follow. Can council, con can council confirm that the temporary sign policy is under review? And the second part was, when the policy is reviewed, will community groups and the arts and culture reference group be consulted to help ensure the policy is relevant and effective? So again, thank you for your question. Um, council adopted the temporary community advertising signage policy in 2018, which provided guidance for the community um, of appropriate locations in the hills area that considered proliferation of signage and ensures safety for motorists and the public. This policy has been used as a guide for applications throughout the municipality. I can confirm that Council's Compliance Department is currently reviewing the temporary community advertising signage policy with community consultation to be undertaken through online consultation opportunities. This review is expected to commence in June 2019, so this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, uh, Gillian, for your question. Do, would you like that in writing as well? No, you understand? Is that fair enough? Thank you. We have received another question uh, this time. We've got a lot tonight. Um, from uh, Nisarg Modi, um, I don't notice Nisarg is in the. Oh, okay. Is okay. We can respond to his question anyway. We we shall do. He's not here this evening. Okay. All right. Can, we can respond in. Well, I'm happy to we, respond. We, we will. We will uh, read the. Soon we've got the response, and um, I think we will read the response anyway from. Um, uh, Tracy Parker, thank you, uh, Tracy. So the, 
thank you for the question, even though it's not here. The question was, in addition to the last question I asked in the council meeting about a park in Arden Estate, I, formed, I forwarded similar question to the developer. I have received the following response from the developer. As you are aware, we have paid substantial amounts over the past 12 years to the Cadinia Shire Council for open space contributions. The question should be asked of council as to why it has not provided the infrastructure. In this case, I would like to know the council's response as developer has set responsibility of council. So in, in response to that question, um, yes, it is correct that council does receive um, contributions for developers for the provision of open space. That comes either in the form of a cash contribution or a land contribution, and council uses both of those mechanisms to provide um, open space. A master plan was prepared for the Arden Estate, and this plan identifies the provision of a local park in the latter stages of the estate. So it's the area sort of east of Sandalwood Drive. Um, as the developer has not sought subdivision of this land as yet, council has not acquired the land for the local park. Upon the subdivision of these later stages of the estate, council will acquire the land for the local park. Um, also, if the submitter would like to see a copy of the, pl the master plan for the estate, which shows the location, I'm happy to provide that as well. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Uh, and you'll, um, can we get that written up as a response and um, send it off as well to the um, questioner? Okay, thank you. Uh, we've also received a question from uh, Alyssa Smith. Uh, I know that Alyssa's in the um, gallery I met earlier on. Thank you for coming. Thank you again. I'll um, pass this question over to Tracy Parker to respond. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, uh, Lisa. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't say <laughs> pointing to initially. So the question reads, I would like to know what future plans are in place to redevelop the Cadinia Life Aquatic Centre and whether it will contain enough aquatic space to run additional aquatic programs such as diving, synchronised swimming and water polo. The community deserves an appropriate resource to support maximum involvement. This is something that has not been addressed for too long and is now the only shire locally that is lacking in modern facilities. Um, Cadinia Shire acknowledges that we are um, a growing community and we're very aware of the need to adequately plan for future facilities and service provisions, including recreational facilities. To cater for the future growth, it's proposed to extend the basketball, leisure and aquatic facilities located within the existing Cadinia Life Centre, located at Tumak Recreation Reserve. In the next couple of years, Council will finalise options for the expansion of the centre and undertake consultation regarding the proposed expansion. Best practice regarding the provision of aquatic facilities will be considered as part of this analysis and options assessment. Council at that time will engage with the existing users and industry groups regarding future expansion of the facility. Thank you, Tracy Parker. Um, Alyssa, would, would you like that in writing, that, that answer to the question, your question? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we shall do that. I'm a, I'm a current user myself, quite often. Okay, okay, we can expand that out. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And thank you, Tracy, for your answer. <clears throat> our um, our final final question for this evening uh, is from Gloria Connor, and I do recognise and see Gloria there in the gallery. Uh, nice to see you, Gloria. Um, uh, Tracy Parker, can I ask you to read the question and answer uh, to? To Gloria's question. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Gloria, for your question. So the question reads, I would appreciate a detailed reply to the following comment and question regarding item one, amendment C228, and also item three on this evening's meeting agenda. It has not been possible to read agenda item one in detail prior to this meeting as the print is extremely small. Can you please advise whether there has been opportunity provided for members of the ratepayers community to be informed about the forward planning for the Pakenham structure plan, urban design framework and activity centre zone. Elected councillors and administrative employees are funded by revenue collected from ratepayers and it must be recognised that information is expected to be provided concerning important and significant 
projects proposed by the community, in addition to the community sporting and social facilities. It's also important to provide information concerning the major administrative changes being made and voted upon for the interest and possible benefit of the rate paying community. Thanks, Gloria. So the Pakenham Structure Plan was originally adopted um, by Council back in 2015. Um, this was after extensive consultation and development with the community on the plan. The Structure Plan was incorporated into the Cadinia Planning Scheme via Amendment C211 in 2017. This was subject to conditions by the Minister that that incorporation would expire in December of this year. By this time, Council was to translate the um, structure plan into more appropriate planning tools, such as the introduction of the activity centre zone and the urban design framework. Council agreed um, to seek authorisation from the Minister in November 2018 to introduce the activity centre zone and the urban design framework. Council officers undertook a, a road testing of the documents to make sure that they all spoke correctly to each other and we identified a few parts of the documents that were not consistent. So we've made some changes to the document. This will be considered by Council at the June meeting. After that, we will resubmit for authorisation with the Minister with the aim that we'll be exhibiting the planning scheme amendment in June and July of this year. So during this time, there will be extensive community consultation regarding those documents. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, and we will give uh, Gloria a written response to that question, um, Gloria, in the near future, okay? Thank you. Okay, there's a, a, and a reminder that councillors and staff will be available uh, after the meeting, including myself, uh, if you wish to discuss responses provided to these questions this evening. And staff will be here as well. Before closing the meeting, uh, I advise that we have received eight submissions regarding the draft budget, and three of these submitters have requested to be heard in person in support of their submission. There will be a special council meeting held next Monday in this building, Monday the 27th of May, uh, here in the council chambers, commencing at seven o'clock to provide the opportunity for these individuals to speak to council. Also, there are no planning permits for the, for the town planning committee to be considered for the committee meeting scheduled for the 3rd of June. Uh, that will not be held. That's the weekend before the long weekend. So we're either doing a lot right or a lot wrong. I'm not sure which one that is, but we haven't got any planning coming up. So to the uh, councillors, uh, thank you for your attendance this evening and the staff and uh, the gallery. Uh, this concludes tonight's proceedings and I'll thank you all for, for your attendance and I declare the meeting cl closed. Sorry, Ms. O'Connor.